so thank you very much guys um up next we have arnold laurent who is going to be talking about human-centered api governance hi arnold how are you today uh hi there uh i'm almost fine i got a uh, catch a cold uh last weekend oh, no. so I, I hope i will not sneeze uh while okay. talking so i apologize uh, in advance uh sure but fine. hopefully uh i'm i'm better now i i i don't have my uh very white voice anymore uh, <laughs> so yeah really happy to be awesome. to be here today well do you want to set your slides up and we'll leave you to it thanks very much on yeah. perfect so let's go i so yeah um hello again everyone i'm arnaud Loret. i work at natexis it's a french financial group a uh, subsidiary of the bpco group bpco in french uh, it offers various services such as payments, uh, trading, corporate banking, or employee savings. And uh, I have to say that I have passionate life. It's APIs. I talk about it on my blog and Twitter under the name of API Handyman. I speak about it uh, at conferences like today. I wrote a book, The Design of Web APIs, published by Money. But most of all, I've been lucky enough to be a uh, a cross-functional expert at Natixis for the last three years. I, I work within the architecture and innovation department, which supports all Natixis business lines by bringing expertise on topics such as uh, data, artificial intelligence, robots, UX, UI, or APIs. Uh, I often summarize uh, my job as helping people understand and create APIs. And today, I would like to share this experience, three years, helping many different teams to API all the things. But why API all the things? And Alexis, we are interested in APIs for two reasons. Uh, the first one is to make IT more flexible. APIs limit coupling, hide complexity, make communication between systems more fluid. Uh, it makes them easier to use. You don't need to be an expert to use them. Uh, integrations are faster, reusability is increased, uh, you can reuse your API in various contexts, and all of this makes the whole thing easier to adapt to new business needs. The, the second reason why uh, APIs are important uh, for Netexis is to enhance our business value. On the one hand, by getting expertise from the outside, which will integrate in uh, our offers using APIs, and on the other hand, by providing our expertise through APIs to our existing customers or to totally new markets. Uh, we believe in this so much that we have um, an open banking, open platform team within architecture innovation uh, in charge of supporting the business lines in this area. So it sounds like great things can be achieved with private and public APIs, but all this will only work in practice if those APIs are good APIs. And this is the core of my work at Netexis. I often use the uh, terrible kitchen radar 3000 to explain what is not a good API. In, uh, in a kitchen, nobody wants to turn a magneton on for 13 seconds and turn it off for another 13 seconds and so on until some frozen dish has been defrosted. In a kitchen, People prefer to uh, be able to heat food at a given power for a given duration without being bothered about how a magnetron works. An API must be simple to use, simple to understand, and fulfill users' needs. This API theory, sold by many API practitioners, myself included, seems quite simple. But how does it go in practice? Well, in practice, it's, let's say, complicated. Working on many APIs in the long run helped me realize that there are far more concerns to take care of to actually create good APIs. Reusability, security, uh, performance, contextual design compromise, documentation, organization, and more. And hidden in more, there is major concern, consistency. In order to be uh, simple to understand and simple to use, an organization's APIs must share common look and feel, common behaviors. And if being alone, working on a single API, being consistent is already not that easy. Imagine several people working on many different APIs across a large organization. And 
If it is hard to be consistent when experts work on all of those APIs, imagine when beginners with all the best will start to create even more APIs. Without any help, the chances of uh, creating good APIs at scale are very, very, very low. And last but not least, there may be people who are not convinced by the value of APIs or simply do not even suspect that topic exists. So creating good APIs at scale at a team, company, or group level in the long run, moving from theory to practice, will not be done magically. It actually requires some work. So let's see how to foster the creation of good APIs. For people to adhere to a vision, they must already be aware that the vision exists and then be convinced. And there is no secret, take your pilgrim staff and go everywhere to explain in a didactic way, adapted to the targeted audiences, uh, what are APIs. What you gain by using them, by creating them, the importance of doing them well, whatever their vocation, internal or external use, and insist on the fact that uh, it does not cost more uh, to do well. On the contrary, the leverage effects are even rather interesting. And when I said targeted audiences, I mean IT, business, and management. But why make IT aware of APIs? In IT, you already know APIs are formerly web services. We have been doing them for decades, and we know how to do them and do them well. Uh, but according to my experience, this is true in some cases, but very often, we are far from what we call today good APIs. We are more facing technical connectors that does the job. But these are really APIs that you can put in the hands of anyone without uh, worrying too much. They are often complex APIs, hard to understand, hard to use, brutally exposing the internal mechanics. Uh, they can even be dangerous uh, in non-expert hands. Very often, the technical side is mastered, but very often, the design vision is missing, and especially uh, the new business dimension of APIs, which is something new for IT people. So it's very important for IT to become aware of that in order to move forward. When talking to business people about APIs, it's often a question of uh, moving in a totally new world. You have to make them understand that these application programming interfaces have business value, but working on internal APIs is a tremendous lever for business flexibility, but external APIs can open up new markets. And whether we are talking to IT or business about APIs, it's important to hold joint session and make them understand that APIs have become a subject for both of them, that working in silos on APIs is not possible. And finally, orthogonally to IT and business, it's very important that the management chain is on board because uh, if there are no sponsors, it is sometimes difficult to move forward, even if the operational teams are convinced. Fortunately, at Natixis, we had that sponsorship at fairly high level from the start. But convincing people of the benefits of APIs and the importance of doing them well is a good start, but the road is still long. And the next step on your journey is being able to create consistent APIs. Take a few popular APIs and compare them. You see that there are variations in the way they are designed. If you ask, uh, let's say, four API designers uh, about how to do this or that, there is a good chance that you will get six different valid answers. And if in the vast outside world, seeing different organizations creating APIs with different design, different look and feel, it's totally normal. But seeing that inside an organization, it's a problem. Consistency in API design is essential within an organization because once developers have understood how a first API works, if the next one is consistent, they will not be disoriented. They will feel just like home and so use it very uh, quickly. This common base, uh, these design rules that will set the look and feel of your APIs are defined in what is called API style guides or API design guidelines. Having guidelines does not matter only for 
uh, building great developer experience, but also matters for people who will design APIs. Defining a common base allows each designer uh, to avoid wasting time trying to find a solution to a design problem that has already been solved. But that will only work if those guidelines apply the good API theory. Uh, these guidelines must provide the best possible designer experience. They must be simple to understand, simple to use, and fulfill their actual needs. So do not reinvent the wheel, do not reuse possibly outdated and highly specific practices. Follow outside world standards and common practices. That will make your guidelines easier to follow. Uh, do not write your guidelines in a complex, simcovoluted, incomprehensible, uh, super experts that love to hear themselves style. Uh, if people can understand your guidelines, be sure they will not apply them. Make them simple to use, just like you would do when creating API documentation. Once you have defined your rules, create use case oriented design pattern or kind of design recipes describing in one place all rules that actually apply in a given context. That way, people will not lose their time and easily design guidelines compliant APIs. Define rules only when it is actually necessary. If you are unable to explain a rule, don't put it in your guideline. Design rules must exist only to help people, not unnecessarily constrain them. And listen to people. Accept changes, evolutions. Rules are not set in stone. You must never hesitate to make them evolve by adjusting or completing them uh, based on API designers or implementers' feedback. Now, if everything goes well, we have people aware of the theory. We have rules that make it easier to implement. So what could go wrong when creating API at scale? Well, lots of things if you don't actively help people to design APIs. It's not because you broadcast the message, oh, APIs are good and should be taken care of this way, but it would be actually heard, well received, and applied correctly by everyone. Even though people try to follow the rules, sometimes they will make mistakes inadvertently or because they misunderstand the rules. Guidelines don't cover everything if uh, it's sometimes necessary to invent new design patterns. But not all consistency matters can be solved by guidelines. Is an API consistent with other APIs in the domain? Is a customer, an account, or any other business concept defining an API operation is uh, consistent with other operations or with what is done in other APIs in the same domain? While uh, form is important, Substance is vital to an API. Having design guidelines does not guarantee that an API will meet the right need in an efficient way. Do we have the right vision of the need? Is the, rest the, re the resulting API really user-friendly? Is it to understand, is it to use for someone outside of the organization? It could be another team, a partner, or a customer. Whether you are a beginner or an experienced designer, you can make mistakes on purely formal issues, even when you know the guidelines. Uh, one can also produce an API that is totally compliant with the guidelines, but fail on the substance, and so create an API that is useless. So, no matter how much people know about APIs, the importance of their design, the organization, uh, the guidelines, so it's important to do API design reviews. It's important that several people can look uh, and challenge a design. Uh, and then an API must be analyzed from different perspectives, business, technical, developer experience to guarantee success. And it's important that at least one external person do this review or one who can act as if. Uh, because we can, we can quickly fall into the creation of uh, API for specialists. And so they will look like the kitchen of our 3000. But beware of API design reviews. They can quickly turn into a counterproductive trial if you're not careful. A design review is not about policing and beating up on people because their design is breaking the law, not compliant, or worse, it sucks from the reviewer's perspective. An API design review is not the inquisition of API design. Seriously, nobody expects the API inquisition, but literally. being. An API design reviewer is more about being a consultant, 
helping people identify their needs, choosing the best possible representation, helping them make decisions adapted to their context, explaining the consequences of going into one direction or another, and let them choose because they are the owners of their API. API design reviewers must respect API ownership. Actually, sometimes they must make people realize that the APIs they are working, uh, they are working with uh, are their API. And so they should stop blindly say yes to any demand and start thinking about uh, how to make uh, the API evolve for the greater good. So that's why I always present reviews as a help and not a control. That makes people more comfortable with it. I always propose to teams that don't feel comfortable with the first API design that the review becomes a design workshop, and so we'll design the API together. Such reviews can also be done on pre-existing APIs, especially at domain level, in order to avoid the gap uh, between current state and ideal good APIs. This allows uh, the team to know where to go. While executed, these reviews or workshops are a great lever to foster the creation of good APIs in terms of form, but most important, content. It allows people to, um, to improve their skills because they learn a lot during reviews, and it also fosters the idea of API ownership. Incidentally, it also allows to plot even more, to plant even more the seeds of the API thinking. And finally, if it's well done, if it helps people, they come back and talk about you to other teams, which makes my work even easier uh, because I'm a cross-functional expert. But before people are happy and come back with pleasure, uh, you have to pass the first contact. And being a cross-functional expert, offering service like API design reviews, uh, even if you are the best salesman with the best services, if your services are not free of charge, they have little chance of being requested. That's why we have chosen to not charge those services. Of course, the business units of the teams pay us indirectly. But when we intervene uh, on an API with the team, it's always a relief for them to know that their budget will not be impacted by yet another cross-functional freeloader. So thanks to this financial subterfuge, and especially thanks to the service offered, we are really well received. But personally, I don't want to set myself up as a, an ad vitam expert for all teams. That's not my goal. My goal is to lose my job. I want to teach the teams how to fish and not bring them fish every day. First of all, because in a large organization, it's difficult to be available everywhere all the time for everyone, unless you have an army with you. Uh, secondly, because it's much more productive for a company and its employee to have everyone add to their expertise, and it is much more personally rewarding to share our expertise. Uh, so uh, with my team, we are now working with several teams to identify relays and set up a new organization to enable the delegation of our activity in the long run. First of all, we look for information relays, which will allow us to have a better vision of what is happening locally in terms of APIs, to have better feedback on what we do, and uh, allow local teams to have a closer first point of contact. We also look for future local experts in API design and architecture who will be able to do locally what we do transversal. Eventually, it is uh, those local experts uh, that the team of the business unit will turn to in order to help them in the creation of their APIs. But to get there, even if the people can be trained uh, on the job through uh, design reviews and workshops, it's important to structure a real training offer among various sessions about how we actually do APIs and analytics or API architecture concern, we initiated the creation of three-part API training cycle. The first part allows to acquire the basic of API designs, uh, basically, in, at the end of this session, participants will be able to design a basic API of this way. A second part coming soon will focus on more complex use cases, such as modeling processes, managing insectarism, or managing evolution. We will also study large-scale design aspects, such as cross-API consistency, choosing to create one or more APIs. And the last part will be about API design reviews, how to analyze in an exhaustive and objective way, an API, how to accompany people in the design of our API, 
what questions to ask, what attitude to hold. I will not hide the fact that the first and second part are strongly inspired by uh, the content of my book and our guidelines. For the last part, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more complicated because uh, it will be a matter of formalizing uh, what I do on API Design Review uh, in order to have an approach that can be easily reproduced by many people. And above all, uh, having an approach that avoids uh, the errors that are typical of activities aiming at giving an opinion on something. But wait, my session is called Human-Centered API Governance. And I didn't say the G word yet. Actually, I've been talking about the dreaded API governance all along. People are more often than not frightened by governance because it is too often synonymous uh, with polis or even Kafkaesque dictatorship. In its worst version, we imagine it being uh, the work of old bearded men who will issue diktats from their ivory tower. These old bearded men being accompanied by an army of henchmen who will zealously make sure that everyone goes straight and beware of those who don't. From my perspective, Governance must not be like that. Governance is about enabling people uh, to do things the right way, as simply as possible. And everything I just described, raising awareness, user-friendly guidelines, offering uh, a framework that helps people, reviews, workshop to help and grow, organization, training, all this is governance. But a governance that is uh, human-centered. A governance that capitalizes more on culture, people, and skills rather than on control for control's sake. But be careful. Don't believe there must not be any constraints. You have to know how to adapt the level of constraint according to the context. If at the Natixis level, two unrelated business lines have different representation of a customer in their API, uh, this is not a problem. These entities do not do, uh, do not do the same business. As long as these APIs share the same look and feel described, our, uh, described sorry, by our guidelines, everything is fine. Uh, but the further down the, organiz the organization, the more important the need for consistency and so constraint. Within the API to the same domain, or even within an API, it's extremely important that the behaviors and the models are consistent or even identical. And this is the responsibility of the local teams, who will do this naturally because they have been made aware of it accompanied and trained, not because they have been shouted at by some zealot henchmen. So I hope I was able to talk about uh, API governance without frightening you. Uh, I do not talk about tools and some other things, but the, the very important thing I wish you will remember uh, about governance is that you must focus on people. Whatever you do, focus on people. Thank you. Arnold, thank you so much. Um, that presentation format was one to remember for sure. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, the, we, we've got no questions from the, the audience. Um, yeah. If anybody wants to put anything forward, feel free. The only thing, I mean, it's super interesting to hear from a you know practical implementation of API design, um, you know, working with third party partners and, and kind of you know, how you go through the processes of starting maybe small, uh, maybe scaling those operations, or well, we maybe starting to speed up those operations, and then obviously scale them, and you kind of remove yourself. Um, so, yeah, that was very, very interesting. Something that the only oh, there's a question from the crowd, so uh, from the audience. So, uh, I'll switch to that. So, yeah, how do you um, how do you persuade management to let you offer these services for free across the organization, uh, especially when budgets don't necessarily align? Uh, I just explained that, that the cost of not doing that uh, right. will be the same, uh, maybe by 10, if not 100. Because if you don't help people to design great APIs, you will design terrible APIs that nobody will want to use, that will uh, uh, make longer integration, uh, will be a burden for everyone. And so all projects around your APIs will cost much, much more money. So just that, and also that uh, API design is a skill that is rare on the market. And making people grow on that will uh, make them uh, love their company and want to stay there. If not, they will leave. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Well, very, very interesting. Um, I think that is that is time. I think we're yeah. going for a break. Um, so we'll see you all again, I believe, at one, 10 minutes past 10, 10 minutes past one. And um, thank you so much again, Arnold, for the talk. Thank you. Appreciate it.